this one there, yeah. So the question is about lots of people using iPads. What's the evidence that they benefit learning? Does an iPad help you to think hard? Does it make you more likely to think hard? Does it make you think hard for longer? Uh, okay, that's my opinion. You didn't ask my opinion. You asked whether there's evidence. I don't know. I mean, there's, there is evidence about use, different uses of technology in classrooms. It's quite mixed, you know, and the, because basically this, you know, some technology can help you to do that, and uh, some technology prevents you from doing that. So some technology helps learning and some doesn't. Some helps learning if you use it some ways and, and not others. So it is quite complicated, but it, it is true, and, and I think technology is an area where people just get a bit overexcited, actually. You know, iPads are lovely, so let's give them to everyone and, you know, transform our curriculum. That will be fabulous. So the question is, should we be uh, investing in iPads until there's evidence? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, if, if that's money that could otherwise be spent on something else, you know, why would you? Here's the, um, you know, the, all of these things cost money or they cost opportunity or they cost effort. So you can't do all of them. If you do one thing, that means you're not doing something else. Um, so, but, having said that, quite often our knowledge is partial or inadequate. So you have to balance judgment in interpreting the knowledge. And crucially, the decisions you make about what you do in school aren't just dictated by the impact on learning. So there are all kinds of other reasons. And you know, if we were talking about class size, that would be quite an important consideration because there are all sorts of reasons for having smaller classes that are not to do with how much children learn. And that might be enough reasons to, to, you know, for the huge cost. Let's not kid ourselves that the reason we're having small classes is because children learn more, or that the reason we're having iPads is because children will learn more. I think that's pretty unlikely, personally, and I don't think there's good evidence about iPads, but again, I'd love to be corrected on that. And I, I, I've got to say, if I had money to spend, it probably isn't what I'd be choosing. Okay, that's an interesting, very good question. Is there a way of measuring how good teachers are? Um, simple answer, no. Uh, more complex answer, um, I, think, I think we need to be able to make judgments about how good teachers are, and I really strongly believe that those judgments should be informed by evidence. So if we move away from saying that the um, that, that measurements should do this for us to saying that we still need to be able to make um, sophisticated, well-informed, considered judgments, but we need to be able to do those on the basis of data and evidence, then that's a slightly different debate. And uh, what kinds of data and evidence should we be considering if we were going to do that? Well, uh, there's, there is good, some interesting research. So the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have funded a big study in America, the MET study. If you go go Google MET project, it's measures of effective teaching. Uh, you'll find lots of uh, accessible research on that. And their question was exactly that. Is it possible to measure teaching effectiveness? And they started with three main kinds of measures. So one is learning gains on tests. Uh, and they found that those did stack up reasonably well. So for example, if you look at the same teacher with different classes, say from one year to the next, there's a reasonable correlation. It's not a great correlation, but it's reasonable. If you look at, if a teacher moves from one school to another, uh, do they kind of carry that effectiveness with them? Well, yes, to some extent. Uh, does it matter what kinds of tests you use? Yes, it does a bit. But, you, you know, you're still getting information, even with not that great tests, actually. And even with tests where they're, they're high stakes, you know, the state tests. So that's the first type of measure. The second is observational. So they did have people sitting in classrooms making judgments. But they were trained to do it according to a reasonably strict protocol and they were trained and quality assured. And they found that, for example, you needed to have at least six observations by uh, uh, m uh, more than one person. So a total of six from at least two people to get anything that even approaches a reliable judgment. So if anyone comes into your lesson and observes one lesson, uh, you should say to them, look, you know, to do this properly, you need to be trained, you need to be quality assured, and you need to observe six lessons. And it can't just be you, it needs to be at least one other person as well, who also needs to be trained, quality assured, and supported. Thank you very much.
So, um, you know, that wouldn't be, uh, that's not what we do, that's, you know, that, that's an ideal research scenario. And the third thing they did, which again I think is really interesting, is student surveys. So they asked the pupils in the lesson, uh, you know, what do you think of the quality of teaching? Now, I can feel the anxiety there and surprise, you know, we don't want to do that, surely. But actually, that's quite a good method. It corresponds reasonably well. It depends what you ask them. Really matters a lot what you ask them. So you can get it wrong if you ask about uh, who they like, but you don't ask that. You ask specific questions about what they learn and what they understand and, um, and things like that. And then that corresponds well, reasonably well, with the, the learning gains and the observation. And that's cheap and that's easy. So, so why we're not doing that, I don't know. We've got a, a project underway evaluating, uh, evaluating that in, in A-level context at the moment. And so if anyone's interested in that, then you know, get, get in touch with me. I'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, how are we doing? So the question is, uh, if, if I've accused teachers of being spineless, but where would you, um, uh, if you're being asked to do or required to do something that you, you suspect may not be sound and you need some support or ammunition to, to resist that, where would you look for? Okay, well, this would be one place I'd look, I think. And there are other reviews of, of research impact and, um, you know, what's effective in, in pedagogy and teaching. It, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Um, I, I'm not sure that there's, there's anywhere a kind of simple uh, guide to that. Uh, I mean, actually, I think if someone's asking you to change what you do, the onus should be on them to provide the evidence, really. How well that'll work for you, I don't know. But um, if, you know, if you're a sophisticated understander of research and, and you know a lot about research, uh, then you're in a strong position to resist that kind of silliness. But you're not. You know, how could you be? Because that's not what you do. So I guess what we need is, is better um, collaboration working together between people like me, who, who that is my job, uh, and people like you who need to know that, and why aren't we talking to each other? And you know, what would need to happen? Because part of the problem, you know, you'll say, well, I'm too busy to do all that research or to read all that, but actually I'm too busy to spend my life talking to you as well. So you know, how could that work? Um, we both kind of want to do it, but neither of us, our jobs quite allow us to. So we need to change what our jobs are, perhaps. And um, one of the, Jonathan Sharples is talking later. He's from the York Institute of Education, Effective Education. And he talks about knowledge brokering and how there's a need for some kind of someone in the middle who's not a researcher, who's not a teacher, but sort of speaks to both and puts them together, like a marriage broker. Uh, so, you know, maybe he's somebody we should talk to as well. Um, how am I doing for time? I'm going to get booted out. Or? Finished. Okay. I should finish then. I'm sorry. I'll, I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to talk to me, but uh, for now, thank you. <laughs>